This week on Make It, Hyla travels to LA to talk to Cenk Uger, host and founder of The Young Turks, which is the largest online news show in the world. Hey, it's Hyla. We're here in the Young Turks offices. I'm joined by Cenk Uger. Thanks for having us in here. Appreciate oh, no it. No problem. Uh, so tell us uh, what's going on in here. Uh, well, this is the work area where we've got the editors, the producers, and the hosts. And, uh, they're, they're all preparing the show. Uh, and then you've got control room uh, B over there, Studio B, where we shoot some of the one to three person shows. And then the big studios where we shoot the Young Turks, which is uh, much larger. I, I noticed that the studio is very millennial. You have the stand up desks over here. There's a chess board. There's a bar with alcohol in the background, which I understand your subject matter might drive a person to have a couple of drinks. Yeah. And then there's an iguana. Yeah. Tell me the story about the iguana. Well, the iguana literally showed up one day uh, with a duck. We don't know who left him there, and, uh, and it turns out there's an iguana expert here, Mary, one of our editors, and... Uh, and was that on her resume? <laughs> no, but thank God it was. Uh, what's the iguana's name? Uh, it's Mary Iguana. We are in California. <laughs> that totally makes sense. What happened to the duck? You know, no one knows. <laughs> oh, poor duck. Poor little duck. Okay, uh, I got a bunch of questions for you. Can we go hang out in the studio? Yes. All right, cool, thanks. So for those who don't know, what is the Young Turks? So Young Turks is the largest uh, online uh, news network for millennials. Um, so we dominate among uh, 18, 24 year olds, but uh, also in the, in the higher age groups, uh, we do great as well, uh, sometimes number two to CNN in the older uh, brackets. What do we do? Well, we do all sorts of news. We do politics, current events, uh, entertainment, sports news, movie reviews. So we have about 30 channels now on YouTube, um, and those also extend to Facebook and the other platforms. Here in the LA studio, we produce our eight owned and operated channels. Uh, and they're the lion's share of our views and our revenue. Uh, our politics are progressive and we don't hide it. Um, and we do uh, news a little bit differently. So in the old days they said, okay, be neutral, uh, don't have an opinion on the news. Mm -hmm. No, the only reason we do this show is because we have an opinion and we'd like to change things and I, our audience would like change. We give you the facts first, then we give you our perspective and analysis and commentary. And then we do something that almost no one else does, which is we try to actually fight for change. Mm -hmm. So. Other folks in the media will say, well, then you guys are activists. And I'll say, damn right we are. Uh, we'd love to get money out of politics. We'd love to end the corruption and bring democracy back. And so would our audience. How important of an element is it for you guys to have other voices on your show? I I've debated conservatives from time to time. It's an interesting exercise. It's kind of fun. Um, but uh, no, I, I haven't found an honest conservative that I could put on the network. Uh, and I'm being serious about that. Or the alt-right guys that support Trump. They're not honest actors. Mm -hmm. They lie nonstop. No way I'm putting them on air. So um, tell us a little bit about your business model. So we get our money in a couple of different ways. The two biggest ones are advertising, which is normal, and then the second one is subscription. So th those are our members, and they're the ones that really are, are the growth engine for, for this company. And it makes sense because I want to be responsive to the audience. I want to time our financial incentives to how well we're serving the audience. So we'll give them extra coverage, we'll give them a post-game show, we give them a show called Aggressive Progressives. Old school for the guys who used to do the radio show back in the day, we come back on and do a podcast. All that's for the members and they get it ad-free and so they're happy to support independent media and get all that content and it makes us larger and larger. I want to go back to the early days. I know you were doing radio on Sirius and XM, but in terms of YouTube, right, was that kind of your first video digital platform that you were on, right? Uh, and we started out at, on our own website in the beginning, and of course nobody was watching. Then we tried uh, putting it on in all different places, and we tried uh, MySpace, and that didn't work. <laughs> we tried Yahoo, and no nothing worked. And then one day we put it up on YouTube, and our director, Jesus Godoy, was like, hey, Cheng, you gotta check this out, man. This one's actually working. <laughs> and we started getting more and more views and then s slowly we started to learn. And then we were the first partner ever for YouTube. And, and it was so collaborative between us and the audience and it was wonderful. Um, many years later, the, the dark uh, forces uh, online 
began <laughs> and and they began to corrupt the internet and make it you know now it, what it is today which is half still great half and half trolls. and half evil yeah i'm just curious to know what was it inside of your brain that says let's go let's go play here yeah uh my thesis was look television has giant distribution costs and so you need a billion dollars to get on television to start a network and and when you're starting online you're right there's no overhead there's no giant network that you need you don't need to buy a spot on cable all you need uh back in the day was a computer and and now it's just a phone and and you're on yeah. and there's no gatekeepers so that uh, leads to a much more reasonable doable thing to get on air so that's step number one, which is huge. Uh, and then secondly, if once you take away the gatekeepers, the program directors, the TV executives, and you let the audience make the decisions, they're gonna pick great hosts, way better hosts than any knucklehead TV or radio executive. Right. Uh, in those early days, talk about your team. How many people you had, how much content you were putting out. So for a long time, we just had five people. Uh, J.R. Jackson uh, was our uh, producer back then. Now he's our senior producer, 15 years later. <laughs> and, and Jesus Godot was our director, and he still is after all this time. Um, and Dave Kohler ran around and did all the business and production end. And then it was ben uh, me and Ben on, on air for a long time, Ben Mankiewicz. Uh, well, when was it that you felt confident this was a thing, this was a growing business, this is where you're gonna make your career? At 300 million views, a reporter asked us if we're the largest uh, online news show. And I had that moment where I was like, oh my God, I think we are. <laughs> so, so that was a great moment. And we kept thinking about it. And we kept looking around. And we're like, oh my God. Then we hit a billion views and we did a huge party at YouTube Space LA. And just the other day, we hit 7.6 billion views, which is the number of people on the planet. I mean, that's, it's kind of hard to wrap your head around a number like that, right? Yep. It doesn't, it doesn't, doesn't seem tangible. It doesn't seem real. If you told me, do you think a billion people will ever see or hear your show? Uh, I would have said, no, I mean, that's preposterous. A billion is way too high. And to think of 7.6 billion is obviously unimaginable. Where is Young Turks today as a, as a network as a whole? So Young Turks is on a ton of platforms, YouTube, Facebook, Hulu, Roku, Zumo. Uh, but the lion's share of our audience is on YouTube and Facebook. Uh, YouTube's been our home for a long time, but Facebook now has a tremendous number of viewers as well. And hopefully soon we'll also be do li doing linear programming. We'll be just like a cable uh, news channel. So obviously the success is there, but you don't get successful without failing a bunch. Mm -hmm. So can you talk about some of the failures and, and things that you've learned along the way? So you can't succeed unless you're willing to risk failing. We used to put up a uh, huge uh, segments by themselves on YouTube and we'd go Young Turks hour one segment three October 27th uh, and one day somebody thought hey I wonder if we should chop this up and just do it based on the news stories you we did right mm -hmm. so we did Dick Cheney shoots friend in the face I will click on that <laughs> yes <laughs> you got my <laughs> click so that worked a lot better because people understood, oh, that's what I'm going to watch. Right. And then we discovered a thing called thumbnails. <laughs> and then we <laughs> talked to YouTube and figured out metadata and tagging. And we slowly became experts on that. Right. And we failed our way to success. Sounds like you're getting more views than CNN or CBS you know, morning show or whatever. Do you still feel like that chip on the shoulder? Like, guys. I got billions of people watching me, <laughs> and you're not showing me any love. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely have a chip on my shoulder. And, uh, and our trademark is honesty, so I'm keeping it real. We could break a giant story here, and, and, and it's hard to get coverage of it. And why do you think that is? Because I think a lot of the people that are in the establishment uh, are old, uh, and they're set in their ways, and they grew up on TV, so they think TV is everything and they, they don't understand millennials at all. It's a completely different culture. So when you say, hey, I'm watching a news program on YouTube, they're like, that's so cute. No, me and the 70 year olds are watching the CBS Evening News. Right. Well, congrats, but that's not what anybody under the age of 35 is doing. So I don't need more audience, although I'm happy to have it, God bless, <laughs> right? 
Uh, and I don't need their quote unquote respect, but what I do need is what I call the media multiplier effect, which they deny both things, people that are online, but also politically progressives. Mm -hmm. And so if Anderson Cooper does something, everyone else talks about it. Whereas uh, they suck the oxygen out of the room for any of the online shows, they refuse to talk about them, so then you have no media multiplier effect, which then hurts you in a thousand different ways, including with advertisers. Right, uh, what's a typical day for you? What's your work day look like? So I've got to do the budgets, I've got to do reviews, I've got to do talk to marketing and PR and, and every aspect of this business, engineering, products. So it's a beast. If someone wanted to start their own network, try and start their own online show or channel, what, what would be like the three most important ingredients? Do what you love and start building it slowly and see if you can build, see if you get some love back, is it working? Mm -hmm. Then go out and try to supercharge it. Uh, then don't be afraid to ask your audience or your customers for help. This whole thing, Studio B, Studio A, everything that you see, uh, the audience gave us $425,000 to build it. Wow. And then after Trump got elected, we needed investigative reporters. They gave us $2 million and we hired 12 people. That's amazing. Yes, well, so just ask. Congratulations uh, on all your success. Thank you. And thank you for letting us into the studio, appreciate it. No problem, great to have you here. Thank you.